excerpt from on thinking for oneself by arthur schopenhauer seventeen eighty eight to eighteen sixty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org on thinking for oneself a library may be very large but if it is in disorder it is not so useful as one that is small but well arranged in the same way a man may have a great mass of knowledge but if he has not worked it up by thinking it over for himself it has much less value than a far smaller amount which he has thoroughly pondered for it is only when a man looks at his knowledge from all sides and combines the things he knows by comparing truth with truth that he obtains a complete hold over it and gets it into his power a man cannot turn over anything in his mind unless he knows it he should therefore learn something but it is only when he has turned it over that he can be said to know it reading and learning are things that any one can do of his own free will but not so thinking thinking must be kindled like a fire by a draught it must be sustained by some interest in the matter in hand this interest may be of purely objective kind or merely subjective the latter comes into play only in things that concern us personally objective interest is confined to heads that think by nature to whom thinking is as natural as breathing and they are very rare this is why most men of learning show so little of it it is incredible what a different effect is produced upon the mind by thinking for oneself as compared with reading it carries on and intensifies that original difference in the nature of two minds which leads the one to think and the other to read what i mean is that reading forces alien thoughts upon the mind thoughts which are as foreign to the drift and temper in which it may be for the moment as the seal is to the wax on which it stamps its imprint the mind is thus entirely under compulsion from without it is driven to think this or that though for the moment it may not have the slightest impulse or inclination to do so but when a man thinks for himself he follows the impulse of his own mind which is determined for him at the time either by his environment or some particular recollection the visible world of a man's surroundings does not as reading does impress a single definite thought upon his mind but merely gives the matter and occasion which lead him to think what is appropriate to his nature and present temper so it is that much reading deprives the mind of all elasticity it is like keeping a spring continually under pressure the safest way of having no thoughts of one's own is to take up a book every moment one has nothing else to do it is this practice which explains why erudition makes most men more stupid and silly than they are by nature and prevents their writings obtaining any measure of success they remain in pope's words forever reading never to be read footnote dunkade three one ninety four end of footnote men of learning are those who have done their reading in the pages of a book thinkers and men of genius are those who have gone straight to the book of nature it is they who have enlightened the world and carried humanity further on its way if a man's thoughts are to have truth and life in them they must after all be his own fundamental thoughts for these are the only ones that he can fully and wholly understand to read another's thoughts is like taking the leavings of a meal to which we have not been invited or putting on the clothes which some unknown visitor has cast aside 
the thought we read is related to the thought which springs up in ourselves as the fossil impress of some prehistoric plant to a plant as it buds forth in springtime reading is nothing more than a substitute for thought of one's own it means putting the mind into leading strings the multitude of books serves only to show how many false paths there are and how widely astray a man may wander if he follows any of them but he who is guided by his genius he who thinks for himself who thinks spontaneously and exactly possesses the only compass by which he can steer aright a man should read only when his own thoughts stagnate at their source which will happen often enough even with the best of minds on the other hand to take up a book for the purpose of scaring away one's own original thoughts is sin against the holy spirit it is like running away from nature to look at a museum of dried plants or gaze at a landscape in copper plate a man may have discovered some portion of truth or wisdom after spending a great deal of time and trouble in thinking it over for himself and adding thought to thought and it may sometimes happen that he could have found it all ready to hand in a book and spared himself the trouble but even so it is a hundred times more valuable if he has acquired it by thinking it out for himself for it is only when we gain our knowledge in this way that it enters as an integral part a living member into the whole system of our thought that it stands in complete and firm relation with what we know that it is understood with all that underlies it and follows from it that it wears the color the precise shade the distinguishing mark of our own way of thinking that it comes exactly at the right time just as we felt the necessity for it that it stands fast and cannot be forgotten this is the perfect application nay the interpretation of goethe's advice to earn our inheritance for ourselves so that we may really possess it footnote faust one three twenty nine and footnote the man who thinks for himself forms his own opinions and learns the authorities for them only later on when they have served but to strengthen his belief in them and in himself but the book philosopher starts from the authorities he reads other people's books collects their opinions and so forms a whole for himself which resembles an automaton made up of anything but flesh and blood contrarily he who thinks for himself creates a work like a living man as made by nature for the work comes into being as a man does the thinking mind is impregnated from without and it then forms and bears its child truth that has been merely learned is like an artificial limb a false tooth a waxen nose at best like a nose made out of another's flesh it adheres to us only because it is put on but truth acquired by thinking of our own is like a natural limb it alone really belongs to us this is the fundamental difference between the thinker and a mere man of learning the intellectual attainments of a man who thinks for himself resemble a fine painting where the light and shade are correct the tone sustained the color perfectly harmonized it is true to life on the other hand the intellectual attainments of the mere man of learning are like a large palette full of all sorts of colors which at most are systematically arranged but devoid of harmony connection and meaning reading is thinking with someone else's head instead of one's own to think with one's own head is always to aim at developing a coherent whole a system even though it be not a strictly complete one 
and nothing hinders this so much as too strong a current of others thoughts such as comes of continual reading these thoughts spring every one of them from different minds belonging to different systems and tinged with different colors never of themselves flow together into an intellectual whole they never form a unity of knowledge or insight or conviction but rather fill the head with a babylonian confusion of tongues the mind that is overloaded with alien thought is thus deprived of all clear insight it is well nigh disorganized this is the state of things observable in many men of learning and it makes them inferior in sound sense correct judgment and practical tact to many illiterate persons who after obtaining a little knowledge from without by means of experience intercourse with others and a small amount of reading have always subordinated it to and embodied it with their own thought the really scientific thinker does the same thing as these illiterate persons but on a larger scale although he has need of much knowledge and so must read a great deal his mind is nevertheless strong enough to master it all to assimilate and incorporate it with the system of his thoughts and so to make it fit in with the organic unity of his insight which though vast is always growing and in the process his own thought like the base in an organ always dominates everything and is never drowned by other tones as happens with minds which are full of mere antiquarian lore where shreds of music as it were in every key mingle confusedly and no fundamental note is heard at all those who have spent their lives in reading and taken their wisdom from books are like people who have obtained precise information about a country from the descriptions of many travelers such people can tell a great deal about it but after all they have no connected clear and profound knowledge of its real condition but those who have spent their lives in thinking resemble the travelers themselves they alone really know what they are talking about they are acquainted with the actual state of affairs and are quite at home in the subject the thinker stands in the same relation to the ordinary book philosopher as an eyewitness does to the historian he speaks from direct knowledge of his own that is why all those who think for themselves come at bottom to much the same conclusion the differences they present are due to their different points of view and when these do not affect the matter they all speak alike they merely express the result of their own objective perception of things there are many passages in my works which i have given to the public only after some hesitation because of their paradoxical nature and afterwards i have experienced a pleasant surprise in finding the same opinion recorded in the works of great men who have lived long ago a book philosopher merely reports what one person has said and another meant or the objections raised by a third and so on he compares different opinions ponders criticizes and tries to get at the truth of the matter herein on a par with the critical historian for instance he will set out to inquire whether leibniz was not for some time a follower of spinoza and questions of a like nature the curious student of such matters may find conspicuous examples of what i mean in herbart's analytical elucidation of morality and natural right and of the same author's letters on freedom surprise may be felt that a man of the kind should put himself to so much trouble for on the face of it if he would only examine the matter for himself he would speedily obtain his object by the exercise of a little thought but there is a small difficulty in the way it does not depend on his own will a man can always sit down and read but not think it is with thoughts as with men 
they cannot always be summoned at pleasure we must wait for them to come thought about a subject must appear of itself by a happy and harmonious combination of external stimulus with mental temper and attention and it is just that which never seems to come to these people this truth may be illustrated by what happens in the case of matters affecting our own personal interest when it is necessary to come to some resolution in a matter of that kind we cannot well sit down at any given moment and think over the merits of the case and make up our mind for if we try to do so we often find ourselves unable at that particular moment to keep our mind fixed upon the subject it wanders off to other things aversion to the matter in question is sometimes to blame for this in such a case we should not use force but wait for the proper frame of mind to come of itself it often comes unexpectedly and returns again and again and the variety of temper in which we approach it at different moments puts the matter always in a fresh light it is this long process which is understood by the term a ripe resolution for the work of coming to a resolution must be distributed and in the process much that is overlooked at one moment occurs to us at another and the repugnance vanishes when we find as we usually do on a closer inspection that things are not so bad as they seemed this rule applies to the life of the intellect as well as to matters of practice a man must wait for the right moment not even the greatest mind is capable of thinking for itself at all times hence a great mind does well to spend its leisure in reading which as i have said is a substitute for thought it brings stuff to the mind by letting another person do the thinking although that is always done in a manner not our own therefore a man should not read too much in order that his mind may not become accustomed to the substitute and thereby forget the reality that it may not form the habit of walking in well-worn paths nor by following an alien course of thought grow a stranger to its own least of all should a man quite withdraw his gaze from the real world for the mere sake of reading as the impulse and the temper which prompt to thought of one's own come far oftener from the world of reality than from the world of books the real life that a man sees before him is the natural subject of thought and in its strength is the primary element of existence it can more easily than anything else rouse and influence the thinking mind after these considerations it will not be matter for surprise that a man who thinks for himself can easily be distinguished from the book philosopher by the very way in which he talks by his marked earnestness and the originality directness and personal conviction that stamp all his thoughts and expressions the book philosopher on the other hand lets it be seen that everything he has is second hand that his ideas are like the number and trash of an old furniture shop collected together from all quarters mentally he is dull and pointless a copy of a copy his literary style is made up of conventional nay vulgar phrases and terms that happen to be current in this respect much like a small state where all the money that circulates is foreign because it has no coinage of its own mere experience can as little as reading supply the place of thought it stands to thinking in the same relation in which eating stands to digestion and assimilation when experience boasts that to its discoveries alone is due the advancement of the human race it is as though the mouth were to claim the whole credit of maintaining the body in health 
the works of all truly capable minds are distinguished by a character of decision and definiteness which means they are clear and free from obscurity a truly capable mind always knows definitely and clearly what it is that it wants to express whether its medium is prose verse or music other minds are not decisive and not definite and by this they may be known for what they are the characteristic sign of a mind of the highest order is that it always judges at first hand everything it advances is the result of thinking for itself and this is everywhere evident by the way in which it gives its thoughts utterance such a mind is like a prince in the realm of intellect its authority is imperial whereas the authority of minds in a lower order is delegated only as may be seen in their style which has no independent stamp of its own everyone who really thinks for himself is so far like a monarch his position is undelegated and supreme his judgments like royal decrees spring from his own sovereign power and proceed directly from himself he acknowledges authority as little as a monarch admits a command he subscribes to nothing but what he has himself authorized the multitude of common minds laboring under all sorts of current opinions authorities prejudices is like the people which silently obeys the law and accepts orders from above those who are so zealous and eager to settle debated questions by citing authorities are really glad when they are able to put the understanding and the insight of others into the field in place of their own which are wanting their number is legion for as seneca says there is no man but prefers belief to the exercise of judgment unus quitescu mavut crider quam judicar in their controversies such people make a promiscuous use of the weapon of authority and strike out at one another with it if any one chances to become involved in such a contest he will do well not to try reason and argument as a mode of defence for against a weapon of that kind these people are like siegfrieds with a skin of horn and dipped in the flood of incapacity for thinking and judging they will meet his attack by bringing up their authorities as a way of abashing him argumentum ad vercundium and then cry out that they have won the battle in the real world be it never so fair favorable and pleasant we always live subject to the law of gravity which we have to be constantly overcoming but in the world of the intellect we are disembodied spirits held in bondage to no such law and free from penury and distress thus it is that there exists no happiness on earth like that which at the auspicious moment a fine and fruitful mind finds in itself the presence of a thought is like the presence of a woman we love we fancy we shall never forget the thought nor become indifferent to the dear one but out of sight out of mind the finest thought runs the risk of being irrevocably forgotten if we do not write it down and the darling of being deserted if we do not marry her there are plenty of thoughts which are valuable to the man who thinks them but only few of them which have enough strength to produce repercussive or reflect action i mean to win the reader's sympathy after they have been put on paper but still it must not be forgotten that a true value attaches only to what a man has thought in the first instance for his own case thinkers may be classed according as they think chiefly for their own case or for that of others the former are the genuine independent thinkers they really think and are really independent they are the true philosophers they alone are in earnest the pleasure and the happiness of their existence consists in thinking 
the others are the sophists they want to seem that which they are not and seek happiness in what they hope to get from the world they are in earnest for nothing else to which of these two classes a man belongs may be seen by his whole style and manner lichtenberg is an example of the former class herder there can be no doubt belongs to the second when one considers how vast and how close to us is the problem of existence this equivocal tortured fleeting dreamlike existence of ours so vast and so close that a man no sooner discovers it than it overshadows and obscures all other problems and aims and when one sees how all men with few and rare exceptions have no clear consciousness of the problem nay seem to be quite unaware of its presence but busy themselves with everything rather than with this and live on taking no thought but for the passing day and the hardly longer span of their own personal future either expressly discarding the problem or else over ready to come to terms with it by adopting some system of popular metaphysics and letting it satisfy them when i say one takes all this to heart one may come to the opinion that man may be said to be a thinking being only in a very remote sense and henceforth feel no special surprise at any trait of human thoughtlessness or folly but know rather that the normal man's intellectual range of vision does indeed extend beyond that of the brute whose whole existence is as it were a continual present with no consciousness of the past or the future but not such an immeasurable distance as is generally supposed this is in fact corroborated by the way in which most men converse where their thoughts are found to be chopped up fine like chaff so that for them to spin out a discourse of any length is impossible if this world were peopled by really thinking beings it could not be that noise of every kind would be allowed such generous limits as is the case with the most horrible and at the same time aimless form of it if nature had meant man to think she would not have given him ears or at any rate she would have furnished them with air-tight flaps such as are the enviable possession of the bat but in truth man is a poor animal like the rest and his powers are meant only to maintain him in the struggle for existence so he must need keep his ears always open to announce of themselves by night as by day the approach of the pursuer end of excerpt from on thinking for oneself by arthur schopenhauer